Hi, I'm Othias, and this might look familiar, but you better squint because it's no Martini Henry at all. Instead, this is the Nepalese Gehendra, or Ge rifle, among other names. Before I get into all that, however, let's go ahead and put this in the light box. With an overall length of 49.7 inches and weighing in at 9.3 pounds, I can forgive you for thinking it looks like the Martini, however internally it is quite different. Both are lever-operated single-shot 450 Martini chambering black powder rifles. However, the Gehendra has a unique action, and despite not wanting to, fairly unique ammo. Now y'all know that no one is paying me to tell you how interesting Nepalese rifles are. At least not for selling Nepalese rifles. This isn't a marketable thing right now. Instead, nearly all of our funding comes from viewers like yourself, who demand to know more about firearms history. Supporters get early access, our state of the show podcast thingy, and at a higher level, a monthly historical scan. If it's not for you, take a moment to thank those that did chip in, as this is how the work gets done. An example of another helper is our one and only constant sponsor, Ballistol, the medical turned gun oil that has served without failure for over 100 years. Once more, I'd like to remind you all that if you're shooting black powder, it's critical to keep a bottle of this whole or diluted with water on hand in order to quickly clean out your bore and prevent nasty fouling and rust. A gun like, well, I don't know, this thing needs all the help it can get to stay together for the next century. While you're stocking up, don't forget to check out their extras and let them know that we sent you. Now the rifle that I have in my hands today is somewhat shrouded in mystery. The Gehendra was an incredibly rare sight up until about 2002, when the contents of the basically abandoned Nepalese armories were sold to International Military Antiques and the Atlanta Cutlery Company. At that point, basically all of these remaining rifles were discovered in various states of decay. They were sold inexpensively to collectors who have taken great pains to restore them whenever possible, and however possible. Some have also endeavored to unravel their history, frankly near loss due to lack of any detailed accounting at the time of their creation. So what I'm about to tell you today represents the best efforts of those doing the digging, most notably in this case, John Walter. His earlier book and now later articles can be sourced for further details and an explanation of his assumptions. For my part, however, I'm just going to summarize the story to the best understanding available right now. I'd love to hear more come to light after this episode is released. Those caveats in place, let's dig in. This is Nepal, an inland kingdom sandwiched between Tibet and India. One that, thankfully, for the purposes of arms making, had access to raw iron along with coal and other resources. In the early 1800s, however, this wasn't anywhere near being utilized to its potential. While the Nepalese were aware of and likely had some fairly early artisanal firearms available, uh, though they did have a cannon foundry and supposedly a musket workshop, apparently set up by a French artilleryman, their national army was more accustomed to the bow and the blade, as you'd expect. That did not stop them, however, from giving the British something of a black eye during the Anglo-Nepalese War of 1814 through 1816. This was a conflict between the British East India Company leading various Indian forces against the Kingdom of Nepal. Without going into too much detail, there had been some territorial disputes and the British were hoping to limit Nepalese power while pulling them further into their sphere of influence. The better trained, better equipped, and more numerous British forces suffered terrible setbacks at the beginning of their campaign thanks to both disease and underestimating their opponents. In the end, however, more careful planning and incremental progress would win the day, and Nepal would have to accept the 1816 Treaty of Sagali. This established the boundaries between Nepal and the East India Company's holdings. A permanent British representative, or resident, was also installed in Kathmandu, the capital. Obviously, this wasn't the best start to their relationship, but over time, the British East India Company, and later the British government in India, found Nepal to have become a very reliable neighbor. Most famously, the British would recruit Nepalese soldiers into their ranks. These Gurkhas remain famous to this day for their skill and bravery in conflicts spanning the globe. 
This relationship also provided Nepal with more up-to-date military training and, to a lesser extent, arms technology. I say lesser because British interests lie between Nepal and the sea, meaning the kingdom had to frequently negotiate or dodge around the empire in order to improve their armaments. For roughly 100 years after the treaty, the British were only interested in keeping Nepal just armed enough to dissuade the Chinese from expanding into their area of influence. They did not, however, want them carrying the latest and greatest in martial equipment. Still being an independent nation, however, the Nepalese disagreed with this sentiment. Prime Minister Bimsen Thapa, along with his officials and officers, put their defeat on superior British technology and better leadership, especially the use of junior officers. They began a series of reforms, modernizations, and expansions of the Nepalese army. Since the British Empire sat in their way of buying arms, the Nepalese would have to make their own, taking patterns from what was available. Captured British equipment. It's no wonder, then, that we soon see domestic copies of the Brown Bess. Also, rifles like the Brunswick. These would be wielded in the 1854-55 war with Tibet, which ended in a Nepalese victory. Shortly thereafter, British forces were caught up in the Indian Rebellion of 1857, during which the Nepalese Gurkhas, along with the kingdom itself, proved to be reliable allies, giving the British a greater measure of trust. Nepalese internal politics, however, were often unstable, the ruling family members often resorting to straight-up assassination to secure their positions. So the empire was still not happy at the idea of a better armed Nepal because it was an unpredictable Nepal. Besides trust, however, the mutiny had placed Enfield percussion cap muskets in the hands of the Nepalese, so these were copied as well. This was in turn followed by a clone of the U.S. Sharps breech-loading rifle. This design proved too complex for the limited resources of Nepal and was quickly dropped in favor of the much simpler breech-loading Snyder. Ten examples of which had been ordered through James Kenyon, principal of the Durbar School in Kathmandu. These came from Charles Lancaster in the summer of 1867. The British officials weren't too happy with how quickly the Nepalese had mastered their construction. And this was really the heart of the issue. The kingdom was absolutely determined to have up-to-date arms as much as possible, and was even willing to produce rifles and ammunition, no matter how poorly, at home. The skill at duplication was present, however, quality metal, and especially machine tools, were not and hard to come by. The British made every effort to block these advances. The result was a lot of smuggling, particularly of things like percussion caps and primers, which were smaller and easier to get into officials' and officers' baggage as they traveled on, well, regular business. In 1887, Dev Shamsher Young Bahadur was given command of the Nepalese army, and a new rifle was introduced, which became known as the De Rifle. While it might look like a Martini Henry, minus its cocking indicator, this was actually a copy of a Francot modified Martini rifle. While the lockwork is nearly the same, it has been changed to fit in a sort of packet assembly, which could be removed whole from the receiver, making it easier to service. While the concept was good, the execution in Nepal was fairly poor, which meant that the locking strength suffered. Curiously, the breech blocks were over-hardened, making them likely to shatter. The barrels were formed on a mandrel by wrapping and hammering strips of frankly poor quality metal. British period reports indicate these were produced at a state arsenal in Naku. The facility was equipped with water power and several motors, along with industrial hammers. However, most of the tooling wasn't in proper use. Uh, much of the equipment was, by 1894, worn and in disrepair. The majority of the work was being done by hand. Each rifle was proof-tested with local ammunition, which again was of poor quality. The powder was very coarse and lacked uniformity, likely producing much less pressure than the British 450 cartridge that it was actually a copy of. So while this was the goal, it was hardly the reality. The handmade cartridges had to be individually fit to keep them remotely in spec. That means filing individual brass cartridges. Test firing frequently resulted in burst barrels or gas escape from the breech. However, they were able to slowly produce their own breech loading rifles at a rate of about four a day, supposedly. While it wasn't an impressive weapon, it did prove to be quite useful indirectly. Seeing the Nepalese struggle to produce their own arms and meeting with any success on that front, especially combined with failed efforts to prevent arms and component smuggling, combined with a growing interest and trust after reforms uh, to ease recruitment of Gurkhas into the British and Indian armies, 
This all resulted in the British being willing to at least talk about helping Nepal in modernizing its arms. If they were going to have more guns, it ought to at least be under British eyes and with payments to British industry after all. Lord Lansdowne put the matter to paper in October of 1893 with the following kindly offer. In the future, all transactions relating to the import into Nepal of warlike stores and material should be conducted in a perfectly open manner, and that every facility should be given to your highness's government's desire to procure cannon, rifles, ammunition, or any warlike material or stores whatsoever. This, of course, resulted in a request for 8,000 Martini Henry rifles along with Gardner, Hotchkiss, and even Maxim machine guns, not to mention quick fire and mountain guns plus ammunition for all of the above. And while we're at it, Nepal could really use some boring rifling and cartridge making machines. British resident, then Lieutenant Colonel Wiley, did not like this wish list and repeatedly pointed out that the Nepalese were far too adaptable to be given this opportunity for expansion. Ultimately, the British would concede to send a battery of mountain guns and 8,000 Martini Henry rifles. These were of the Mark II configuration and were delivered in 1894. And just so you can understand what these meant, the estimated strength of the Nepalese army in 1894 was roughly 17,000 regulars with 2,517 artillerymen and perhaps 123 cavalrymen. Irregulars could be fielded to the tune of about 24,700 men, so 8,000 rifles did not cover it. The balance was made up with domestic rifles, the aforementioned Martini, Francot, and Snyder being the most common. However, the muzzle-loading Enfields were apparently still in some service at this late date. All this is to say that it's clear that the Nepalese were not going to have all their needs met by dealing with the British directly, nor by using their limited state factory. Thankfully, another option would come forward thanks to a native technologist, Gehendra Shamsher Yang Bahadur Rana. Born in 1871, son of a noble member of the Rana family, his father was, about at this time, envoy to India. Gehendra was given an excellent upbringing, privately educated before attending the Durbar High School. This was an English-style secondary school established in 1854. Uh, little is known about his actual education or experiences beyond here. However, it appears that he saw the usual familial political appointments. I've been told at age 14 he was apparently involved with the ammunition depot of the Royal Nepalese Army. Gehendra took a keen interest in small arms ammunition and other machine technologies. At the age of 16 he entered the army proper, commissioning as a colonel. By this same time his father had become Prime Minister of Nepal. Bir Shamsher Young Bahadur placed his son in charge of several other promising young men and sent them off to India and Japan to study modern manufacturing methods. One of those students was apparently Bakhta Bahadur Bosniat, a man we'll hear from later on. Gehendra, however, is often regarded as Nepal's first modern technologist. While he wasn't what we'd consider a full-fledged inventor from scratch, he frequently adapted available foreign devices to Nepal's unique needs and abilities. In this regard, he created rice mills, wind-driven water pumps, a printing press, and even a steam-powered electrical power station, a first in Nepal. Later on, he would even import a Ford motor car in an attempt to create a modified domestic motor. Obviously, Gehendra was a modernizer, and he applied this same philosophy to the Nepalese army, or at least those troops he commanded. The firearm we are not discussing today is his mitrailleuse, a manually operated machine gun named for his father, the Bira gun. By all means, though, I'd be happy to borrow one for another episode. Gehendra also developed a new cannon named for his grandfather, but obviously we only care about this, the rifle he named for himself. Now, you might ask yourself, why didn't he just clone the Martini Henry? It's strong, and they had plenty on hand to copy, and the state arsenal was already producing a frankly more complicated version of said firearm. Well, like I said, they were copying it poorly. You can learn a lot more about the Martini Henry in our episodes dedicated to its development. However, just as a reminder, it used a powerful coil spring to drive what proved to be a somewhat fragile striker if it was produced improperly. This combination of metallurgy, coiled wire spring, and precise dimensions made the Martini a bad choice for the Nepalese. It's no wonder that the Francot derivatives were failing rather miserably, so Gehendra opted for something else. Now, as I said, he was less of an inventor and more of a blender and simplifier of technologies. So, where did this particular rifle come from? Well, the core concepts appear to have originated from Wesley Richards. 
Back in 1869, Richards had patented a tipping block single shot breech loading rifle, which used a lever set in front of the trigger guard to open and close the breech along with cocking the single action hammer. This system was simple and robust, and unlike the Martini Henry, it used no coil springs, nor did it have a fragile striker. This was simpler to make, and yet provided the same opportunities as the British Martini. Gehendra would keep the pivoting locking block. He also liked the flat springs and the hammer operation. By the way, unlike coil springs, flat springs could be readily purchased commercially, or if desperate, made at home. He also kept the lever at the front of the action. However, he did add some refinements. We could probably just go ahead and look at them right now. All right, this is a long rifle, so it's going to take a moment to get through the whole thing. But let's start at the front for just a moment. You'd be forgiven for thinking that this was a Martini Henry if you only looked at the entire forestock, because we have a familiar sight, nose cap, cleaning rod with spring tension setting it in there, a uh, clamping band, although of very hand fit quality. Uh, no upper hand guard. We have a groove down the entire bottom for that cleaning rod. If we bring it down, sure enough, lower band clamp, just like you'd expect. And even looking at that rear sight, that is definitely familiar. Here is our Gehendra, and here is a Martini Henry Mark II with an updated rear sight. Obviously, this is a little bit older pattern style, but you can tell who was copying who. Now, it's marked in Devanagari, but otherwise, this would be very familiar to a British soldier. Both rifles have their four stocks pinned in place uh, with a lug under the barrel. In the Gehender's case, it's a little bit further forward and doesn't seem quite as large in diameter. One of the more controversial aspects of the Gehendra is actually its barrel more so than its action. Now with the Martini Mark II, you can see we have a nice long Knox form. We have a short one on the Gehendra. This is a quality steel barrel. This guy, uh, the majority of them seem to have been uh, drawn iron, which while stronger than the mandrel barrels of the Francot, and apparently some Gehendras have turned up with mandrel style barrels, is still nowhere near the quality of this guy. I'm unsure if the Nepalese had many problems with these barrels failing because there's not really a strong distinction between the Francot and the Gehendra in service in Nepal. So all of the barrel failures that we see in our notes might have actually been just the Francot. But anybody that wants to work with one of these firearms should be aware of its potential limitations and adjust accordingly, especially because even disregarding the handmade nature, the artisanal nature of the construction of this barrel and rifle, you have to also account for a lot of abuse in storage. So watch out. The buttstock is also similar in profile. We have an iron butt plate, although sometimes brass is noted, and it has a little bit of an overhang, although the screws are still both at the rear. If I bring her forward, we can see that we actually have a deep set tang. This is a more traditional method of assembly for a rifle at time, see, tang and tang, top and bottom, that is not like the Martini, which uses a stronger socket arrangement. Seaver looks a lot like the Martini. Uh, you'd even be forgiven for thinking it was a socket fit if you only looked at it from the side. Now, the trigger group, though, and the operating lever are distinctly different. Now, I know a lot of people aren't good at remembering shapes, so let me just go ahead and put these side by side for a moment. Well, as best I can. And you can see that the Martini has a distinct trigger guard, a lever behind which operates the action. And it's sprung into its two positions very effectively. On the Gehendra, we actually only have, well, one component, no separate trigger guard, that is part of the lever, which is now fixed at the front of the action, rotating way up here, right at the beginning of the receiver. And uh, if we lever that guy open, you'll notice there's no real tension at the moment. And to close it, there's no tension. This might seem like it's not working correctly. For a martini, it would be very alarming if you felt it working this way, but this is normal for the Gehendra. You're supposed to operate the action until it cocks. There would be spring tension, by the way, if we had decocked. As a matter of fact, I can do that. I can hold the lever, pull our trigger and let the hammer come on down with it. At which point there's actually quite a bit of spring tension because the hammer is pulling into the action. That biases it into the closed position, which is good. That means when you fire the gun, there is tension holding it shut. But when you go to operate it, we're working against that hammer spring. There's nice springy tension until it cocks. And you can even see the trigger move because the tr trigger operates right on the hammer. We'll see that better in our animation. Once it's cocked, all the tensions come out of the system. 
So you have to manually return this, at which point you hit these two little tines here that it then clicks into place. These have to be bent just right to allow this to close and lock for a second, and then pop when you go to release it. They tend to get bent. You may have to adjust them back if you encounter a rifle like this. I had to when we got this one. Now, it's also worth noting that there's a large sling swivel that is fitted inside of the trigger guard slash lever, and yet is not quite big enough to clear it in the wrong position. You can tell this one's taken on a bend because of being whacked. Ideally, the gun was supposed to be fielded with a sling uh, at all times, which would have kept this tensioned up out of the way where it would never be a problem. However, in reality, uh, those rotted away and the gun still continued to be tinkered with. And so a lot of these have bends in this particular wire. Now, just so you can see it more clearly, this is still very much like a martini in that it has a tipping block. Uh, and when we operate the lever, it drops so that we can feed here. The extractor works the same too. It's a little teeter-totter bump out mechanism. Again, we'll see it better in the animation. And we close things back up when in place. So you would open, it would auto extract. You would load your singular round, push it all the way into the chamber, close up the action, and then you're ready to fire. Now, while we're in this position, you can see there's some wonderful, unique Debenagari markings at the back of this receiver. Uh, this is actually what we might call a Cha rifle. I'll explain that a little bit better with some handy visuals in just a moment. We'll also discuss these markings here, and just so you can see where they are, that is actually on the underside of the uh, operating lever. Let me see if I can get you a shot, by the way. Down into the, I guess you could call it the sear mechanism. It's, uh, oh boy, right down in here. I'm sorry it's so hard to see. It'll be much more visible in the animation. I just wanted to point out that it's very exposed. You can actually see where the trigger meets the hammer right out in the open underneath the sort of armpit of our operating arm. Uh, that means that if I were to cock this open a little bit more, you may be able to just make out, yeah, sorry, that piece of wire just gets right in the way, doesn't it, folks? Let me put it down there, maybe. Boy, that's a bit difficult. You may be able to just see that little sear poking out on the other end of the trigger. Teeter-totter, teeter-totter. That is right where we meet our hammer, so. There it is resting, and if we fire the gun, it slips by, and the whole thing comes crashing down. Again, if you were to try to fire the gun out of battery, it's gonna snap itself shut. Although, could more of the tension on there. See, nice and whip. Uh, and because of the Martini system, an out of battery is nearly impossible because the block tips, and since it tips, the firing pin can only align with the primer and therefore strike it when the breech block is in a secure position. The bayonet was a socket type modified from the British pattern of 1876 with a 22 and 1 8 inch triangular blade. Honestly, while this firearm is simple, the screws are fairly soft and it's a lot of a bother to get them in and out quickly. So let's make things a little easier, at least for me, and have Bruno provide us with a frankly beautiful animation. At its core, the Kahindra is a tipping block breech loader. Like the Martini, it's lever-operated, single-loading, and ejects while the action is recocked. Here is the breech block, with a slope cut in its top to allow for feeding and ejecting our cartridges. It's held up at its face by this combination lever and trigger guard, which sports a pair of extensions at its top near the breech face. Rocking the lever down not only releases the breech block, it also pushes the lever extensions against lower protrusions on the breech block, forcing it downward at its face, opening the action. This allows the shooter to feed a single cartridge. Closing the lever drives the extensions back under the front of the breech block, forcing it back into lock. Between the lever's extensions and traveling partially inside the breech block is the hammer with attached firing pin. It's constantly sprung forward by its own flat spring. It is held back, however, by a direct engagement with the trigger. This too has its own flat spring. Pulling the trigger releases the hammer to fall, striking the primer and discharging the round. The hammer also has an extension at its lower front. Dropping the rear of the lever presses up on this extension, recocking the hammer as we clear the action. This leaves the action ready to fire again. Like the Martini Henry, the breech block and the Gehendra acts directly on the extractor. When the action is opened, the front of the block falls, striking the rear extension of the extractor, tipping it back. A pair of projecting tines pull the case from the chamber. And that's it. A very simple action overall. Now let's go shoot it.
This is one of the most beautiful rifles I think I've ever seen. And then you handle it. Production of Gehendra's rifle was undertaken by his own private factories, with the work most likely centered at a factory in Sundarajal. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Machine tools for the production of rifles, the Bira gun, and ammunition were purchased from Greenwood and uh, Batley of Leeds, and it's estimated that they were delivered in 1896, the most likely origin point for the Gehendra rifle. That would mean Nepal's domestic single-shot black powder rifle was introduced well into the era of smokeless repeating rifles, and yet, for the region, it was plenty modern at the time. Markings for the Gehendra rifle vary. This was likely due to political changes at the time of manufacture. The earliest examples were just marked with sequential numbers in uh, Deva Nagari. More commonly, we see one of two mass production markings set along the back of the receiver. These characters initially read Shri, an honorific, General Gehendra Shamshur, Yang Bahadur Rana. The underside of the lever was marked Shri Ge Rifle. After a few thousand were made, the markings changed slightly. This still features Gehendra's full name, but is preceded by an abbreviation of Commanding General. These serial numbers, by the way, are in three digit blocks of up to 999 though I'm unsure if they always made it that high in each sequence. These are preceded by a character, such as Ge, Ja, La, Na, or one of others known. They appear to have been made with dies that were used to strike other characters, specifically at first in the word general. In 1901, Prime Minister Bir Shumshur, Gehendra's father, passed away. His position was filled by Gehendra's uncle, the aforementioned Dev Shumshur Young Bahadur. Pushing for further modernization, Dev Shumshur was a progressive voice seeking reforms in Nepal, like universal education that frankly threatened the elites. During this time, Gehendra had risen to general and was placed in charge of both the police and Nepal's intelligence agency, making him a spy master. Uncle Dev's position didn't last long. He was deposed after just 144 days of reign and exiled to Dankara. Nominally, as the governor of East Nepal, though he later chose to flee to India. He was succeeded by his brother, Chandra Shamshur, who had been commander of the Nepalese army during Dev's brief reign. Under Chandra, it seems the Gehendra rifle came to be used by the army proper, or at least that's one assumption made because of the changes to the markings. Around 1903, the dedication moved from the back of the action to the right side. It now read with Sri, honorific, ahead of Chandra Shamshur Yang's name. A production date is also present, 1959 in the Bikram Samwat calendar, about 56 years and 8 months ahead of the Gregorian, making this 1902 or 1903. The serial number was still placed at the back. Soon after, however, all of the script returned to its original location, though it was still dedicated to Chandra. While the Gehendra rifle had just really begun to maybe start replacing the Martini Francots, it wasn't enough to offset British concerns. Once again, in 1906, they were worried that Nepal wasn't strong enough to serve as a buffer against China. It was particularly noted that the Nepalese army was lacking in musketry drill due to shortages of reliable rifles and ammunition. Then resident Major Manners Smith reported that the 1894 shipment of Mark II Martini Henrys were held in store. The locally manufactured rifles were serving in their place. Many duties were still performed with the muzzle-loading Caplock Enfields. This resulted in a gift of 2,500 more rifles, this time the Mark IV Martini Henry. Welcome additions, but a drop in the bucket. A further gift of ammunition was much more helpful. Sort of. Manor Smith also toured the factories of uh, Sondrijal and uh, Balaji, where the Gehendra was being made, though he described it as a simpler pattern of Martini Henry. His report includes that the Prime Minister had told him 8,983 rifles of this type were then in service. And in that same year, 1906, I should probably discuss the death of Gehendra Shumshur. The explanations are various and frankly speculative. Some say that he dropped a pistol that he was working on in front of Uncle Chandra Shamsher, creating a fear of an assassination attempt. Others say that he was just too popular and influential to be left alone in a family of would-be competition. Regardless of why, or even how exactly, Gehendra died in 1906, officially choking to death on an egg. Definitely not poison. Not that at all. His rifle factory was taken by the government, or perhaps Uncle Chandra directly? It's a bit unclear to me. This act likely spelled the end of the Martini Francot, which is just as well because the very next year quite a few managed to spontaneously disassemble. 
Turns out, using actual British-made 450 Martini ammunition, remember the gift from before, during the musketry practice, wasn't great. The Prime Minister told the British resident that about 55% of their rifles had to be rejected due to defective or damaged barrels. Now, the Gehendra was definitely the domestic rifle, on the basis that it actually worked safely and didn't blow up when you fired British ammo in it. Even so, it wasn't as well produced as even the leftover British equipment, so another request was made for more Martini Henrys. In 1908, 10,000 more Mark IV rifles were given to Nepal. This gave them an inventory of 20,000, half to be held in reserve and half for training. Nepal had also requested boring and rifling machines, but of course these were not provided. They would have been fairly critical for refurbishing existing martinis or improving the Gehendra, as variations in the bore and rifling were perhaps one of its greatest failings. Despite now having more martinis, Gehendra production continued at its slow pace. Though it was now well obsolete, it even saw some improvement. Around 1910 or 11, then Captain Bakta Bahadur Bazniat, remember him from the field trip to Japan? Well, he actually simplified the Gehendra slightly. That resulted in, well, actually, this, the improved model. Let's go ahead and get in the light box. With an overall length of 49.7 inches and weighing in at 9.3 pounds, very little has actually changed. It is still a tipping block, lever-operated, single-shot 450 martini rifle. It's just a slightly different arrangement of springs and pins. I'll be very honest, the differences between these two guns are not all that major, but let's go ahead and get a look at this anyway. One of these two guns is not like the other, and I'd forgive you for not being able to tell at a glance. The only clue to an improved model is, being an original model, we have a reinforcing screw here. On an improved, it's there, at the rear. It was moved because of the addition of a singular, large V-spring that powers both the trigger and the hammer, instead of a pair of flat springs, trigger and hammer, in the original model. There's also some minor contouring differences, but this is the big feature. Now, uh, unfortunately, it's gonna be a real pain to get this apart, and even if I did, I don't have a V-spring in this gun right now. It broke. So, we're gonna have to use a little Bruno magic. Yep, that's one spring instead of two, and that's really the heart of the issue. I've also seen mention of changes to the inletting in the butt, but unfortunately I haven't been able to see them in the examples I have here. Supposedly it made the whole thing a lot stronger. These were still marked at the back for Chandra, however the marking under the operating lever was changed to read Sunda Rifle, likely short for Sundarajal, the factory location. While I haven't confirmed examples myself, I'm told this actually happened prior to the mechanical improvements by about two years. It may be that they didn't want to keep marking Gehendra's initial on their stolen goods. Production of this pattern appears to have been quite limited, perhaps only a few hundred. Now sadly, my improved rifle here lacks its mainspring, so we can't use it for demonstration. But that's okay, because I actually have an alternate. This, the only known pattern of Gehendra carbine, also an improved model. With an overall length of 37.9 inches and weighing it at 7.6 pounds, this is far handier than our other long guns. Of course, it is still a single shot and takes the standard 450 martini cartridge, so that's a lot of oomph. Given that the Nepalese army was almost devoid of cavalry, it's suspected that these carbines were whipped up for the minister's personal mounted troops, but frankly, that's speculation. For all we know, they were an experiment for artillerymen? Mm -hmm. Regardless, let's go ahead and make some room and get a closer look at a very rare little thing. From the rear, other than this sling swivel, we're not looking too different. If I bring her on around, yep, the receiver's all the same, except for you may have noticed that there's no longer a sling swivel in the trigger guard. That's a very good tell of an original carbine. And if we bring her on back, we have a, oops, sorry, carbine-sized rear sight that's only graduated out to, I believe, uh, 1,000 yards. I don't think I mentioned it earlier, but the long rifle seemed to have been set for 1,200. So not a huge difference between the carbine and rifle in that regard, if that's true. Unfortunately, I have not sat down and translated all these. If we bring her on back, it's definitely a martini carbine styling all the way to the front, in which we've actually borrowed the martini carbine front sight. That's a uh, barley corn front sight with two 
sort of protectors, they're almost lower than it. Uh, the whole assembly is actually dovetailed into the barrel, which leads us to believe that these were cut down from original rifle barrels. Given the small numbers of production, I doubt they were uh, a dedicated production batch. If we rotate this guy over, we'll see we still have a shortened cleaning rod, so that's standard on this particular guy. The rear sling swivel is a bit of a puzzler to me, because it doesn't seem to have independent rotation, at least not on this example. And uh, it's not a ring, so if this is a single point sling, it's an odd way of going about it that might cause some twisting or discomfort. Alternatively, this may have been a two position sling gun, but where the other position is, is lost to me. Uh, I frankly am unsure of how these were carried, but known carbines do exist in this configuration repeatedly. No front sling swivel, only the rear does not seem to rotate. A little bit of a mystery for you. Given the scarcity of these things, we used a lightened load, but we did take a moment to actually shoot this guy. I thought it was worth it. I would love these things so much more if it weren't for that trigger. I'm gonna wait for May to talk about that though. <sighs> like I said, these are quite rare. Serial numbers have been found up to 15, though only eight are known today. They're all dated for the Nepali year of 1968, which means 1911 or 1912 in the Gregorian. That seems to coincide with yet another gift of rifles. In 1912, 2000 short magazine Lee Enfield Mark III's were provided to the Nepalese government. This was ordered by George V, who was visiting Nepal shortly after they were supposed to arrive. The rifles were meant to allow his host to save face during his review of their troops. From there, Nepal started up their old habit. The short magazine Lee Enfield began to be cloned, but before it got too far along, the Great War intervened. Surpluses post-war meant that Nepal didn't need to undertake their own manufacture. In 1923, an improved treaty of friendship eased restrictions on weapons and ammo imports, along with machinery for production of the same. So, this odd rifle managed to be introduced well after it was obsolete and served right up to the First World War. Thankfully, it seems to have avoided any actual heavy conflict because while it was the best of the domestic options, it was far from perfect, I assure you. Despite Gehendra's desire for machine manufacture, his rifle was still largely handmade. Parts rarely interchange, especially the carefully fitted springs, which were also fairly poor quality. Many today have taken on a set and failed to function well without being retempered and reshaped. They're also prone to breaking. Um, as a matter of fact, that's what happened to this guy. I have both pieces. Uh, the hammers are as well a little fragile, and they have a fairly sharp fall with a narrow neck. The breech blocks are also often improperly fit. Um, you know what, I might need to show you what I mean by that. We have our breech block and our receiver. The receiver has a round cavity, and the breech block acts like the inside of a hinge. It has a round backing. They're supposed to mate perfectly at the rear. The idea being that this is where our locking strength comes from, not from whatever is in the hole being the pin. Unfortunately, if these get separated, then anytime we have extreme recoil, the pin, what is through his hole, is gonna be what takes that impact. And eventually it'll deform until we make contact here, which means you have a lot of these guns that show signs of bent pins. 
Once the breech block isn't fully supported at the rear, and especially if it's allowed to travel rearward over time with the number of firings, that means the gap up here opens up, and you start to have the chances of venting gas or case failures, depending on how far back you make it. Generally, this shouldn't be enough to be disastrous, especially with a big rimmed cartridge, but it is going to get uncomfortable eventually. Drawbacks aside, the Gehendra managed to at least get the job done. A domestically made rifle in a hemisphere where such things were exceedingly rare. So with all that covered, let's go ahead and get May's opinion on shooting perhaps the most beautiful and exotic single shot I know of, the Gehendra. All right, once more, we've made room for May. Hello. And we have, without scraping the ceiling, the <laughs> Gehendra rifle, the early pattern. Thank you. Uh, and I guess let's just get some first impressions here. Uh... Well, first impression is, I don't know if anyone's looking at this whole receiver section and thinking the same thing that I am. Uh, it kind of looks a lot like a martini. Yeah. No, these uh, are two entirely different guns. Look. Right. Only the first three quarters of it are the same. And then the last bit. So <laughs> if you didn't tell me, you know, where this came from or anything, my brain would see the martini and think, did this come before the martini? Because this looks cruder and it doesn't really look... It, it definitely has this this feel about it that it feels like it's in some sort of transitional state. I mean, it very much is a handmade martini in a way. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a dropping block 450 caliber rifle with the exact same uh, rifling, uh, this, practically the same barrel taper, although the, the chamber area is a little locked, forms a little different. Right. The whole front end is built off of essentially the Mark II style like I have here. Mm -hmm. uh, as a matter of fact, this Mark II, I don't know if I mentioned it earlier in the episode or not, um, is Nepal Nepalese marked. Oh, okay. So this one, these yeah. both were in the same country at the same time, which is... Really? Yeah. That looks like that came out way better. <laughs> well, they took better care of these. But yeah, it's, it's actually kind of interesting to think that they had these in hand probably before that one was made. Like that one's newer wow. than this one, most likely, given the, That's given the markings. That's kind of bad. This and feels so hand fit. The carbine that we shot uh -huh. is at least two decades newer than this. Was it, well, I mean, no, actually, I'm sorry. Two decades newer than when Nepal got it. Uh, when was this one actually made? 1874. So, yeah, no, this is 1874. That was made around 1911. So that's like 40 wow, years. Wow, that is... Um, the difference between these two is roughly my age. Okay. Yeah. They didn't really go very far, did they? <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, really, everything about this just isn't screaming like it's... Not only was in a great condition to start, but then was left to just kind of sit somewhere without being taken care of, period. It also feels like they've been reworked. I don't know I don't know what happened in terms of collecting the pieces in their various states of decay, mm -hmm. but they almost all seem to have screws that don't quite fit or are stripped or have been pulled or apart sticking and put back out. together. There's a screw sticking out on this side that I have literally That's the cross managed. Pin, yeah. Okay, yeah, I've managed to snag my skin on it a few times, and if I was not careful enough, I'm sure I would cut myself on it. Yeah, they're not even like the cross Delicious. pin's not properly rounded. There's just tons of little things where I'm going... Were these like forced into longer service or drill or something and they just constantly got refurbished or or what? Like it feels like somebody went back through and touched all of them at some point mm -hmm. and not always for the better. No. Um, but yeah. OK, so let me actually talk about these pieces and make sure uh, I just want to make sure that wasn't in the way of that camera over there. Oh, I'm sorry. No, you're good. Uh, so, yeah, it's a it's a single shot rifle that f should fire the 450 Martini cartridge. Right. And, much it does. The, the, the Frankots, not so much. They tended to burst, but the Gehendras seem to be able to handle it. Yep. I was a little erring on the side of caution, just we, to be safe. We opted for a reduced load. Um, <laughs> the big reason for that is, again, these are hand-fit rifles. Mm -hmm. The breech block does not perfectly fit at the back of the receiver. Uh, there's some weight being transferred in that pin. You never know if you get a gas leak or any other problems. We only have one May. We do only have one May. We and repairing me is a little more difficult, I think, than repairing the rifles. Now, defense the Gehendra. I know people that have good examples that have managed to shoot regular 450 martini loads through them plenty. So It's just whatever you get your hold of, essentially? It's really about having the time to inspect and properly understand your particular rifle. We have to do an episode every two weeks. We reduce the load. So. Better to err on the side of caution. <laughs> I did notice, um, as soon as I picked it up, it doesn't really feel like everything is entirely... Tight. Tight. It does kind of, <laughs> and not only that, there's like a, there's like a, there's a little bit of a, a metallic sound to that rattling inside. And I'm like, oh, what is it perfectly fit internally there too? Yeah. Mm, gotta love it. Um, okay. So like I said, it's a single shot rifle. I have to uh, pop the lever open every time in order to load it. 
And that just kind of flops down there, doesn't it? And bangs directly into this sling swivel that if you do not have a sling on, it can just decide to fall with gravity and get in the way of your lever arm. Isn't that convenient? No, that's a problem of ours because- it's a safety feature. They would have had slings. The, in service, it wouldn't have gone around without a sling. However, and this is another thing we see out in Nepal, they're bent, right? right. A lot no, of them are bent. There's a dome to this that is like a mushroom shaped kind of dome to right. it where clearly this has been beaten on repeatedly because just someone just didn't have the sling there, I guess. Or alternatively, when they were first found and checked for empty, Maybe somebody Ooh. went ahead and we're just doing, you know, you're doing a hundred, a thousand of these. I don't know how many they found. I, but this does kind of look like it was done more than once, though. Yeah, it does. It looks like it's been there for a while. Uh, but with a sling, it shouldn't be a problem. Right. Um, and it's fairly efficient in its positioning. It also kind of comes from the fact that the trigger guard is the lever, mm -hmm. which is a distinct difference from the Martini. It is a distinct difference. Now, I personally am not a fan of how this is set up because... You're losing your trigger guard, essentially. So now, not only is the trigger fully exposed here, but I can also see underneath into where the action is a bit down here. Yeah, you can just flip it over and see the seer engagement on the I shouldn't be able to see that. <laughs> well, you could kind of do that on the early martinis, but they found that to be a big problem. Right. And they sealed up the action. We saw this in our martini episode. Right. They decided it was a problem. Did they fix it on the carbine then, which was 1911? No. Oh, okay. No, so no, it was still wasn't a problem. It's fine. <laughs> that it just makes them more robust. You know, that mud really cakes in there and right, becomes I mean, part of the it action. It could be like the Luger concept, where you just you can get it back out because it's just right there. <laughs> Maybe when I shoot it, it all just blows out the bottom, so it's just pooping itself. Yeah. Well. Okay. How do you feel about the lever, by the way? Which which do you think is more ergonomic? Going all the way back and grabbing, like, say, a Mark II martini lever. So we're, we we mm -hmm. boom, we drop it down, we hit it, we find our thumb hole here, right, and drop and that open. Down. And by the way, look at how that pops into position instead of flopping around. Now, I will say just on looks alone, I will say the martini looks like that one's inherently at least telling you where to grab it. I feel like, you remember that little paperclip icon you'd have in the computer in hey, Windows 95? Clippy. Yeah. Oh, that was his name. Yes. And he'd be like, oh, I'm your helpful little Clippy. I'm here to tell you stuff. I feel like Clippy tells me, hey, that's where you're supposed to lever it open right there. Very clear kip, Clippy designation. Meanwhile, this one, I'm like, well, I have two options. One, I could comblane this and actually reach inside the trigger guard right there. Okay. That does work. Sure. Or I could... Fit my thumb into... No, my thumb doesn't... Pinky? Oh, I could pinky it. That seems okay. painful and dangerous. No, it's fine. Oh, I just twisted, actually. Yeah, right. that seems painful and dangerous with that teardrop. Right. Too. Why? That's not actually I think it's very meant more natchy. for you to be able to get your hand up under the back of it and pull it down. Yeah. I mean, okay, sure, maybe. But, yes. Not my favorite. Um, I'm going to go with Martini on the win on that one, at least for the comparison. I think it's kind of interesting, though, because if you are if you assume your hand is already in the trigger guard, mm -hmm. you have to be able to find the trigger guard in a hurry. You know what I mean? You're shooting, mm -hmm. boom, your finger's in the trigger guard. Mm -hmm. You come down with your finger on the trigger, right, mm -hmm. having fired, mm -hmm. and you just break it open with your finger, okay? Mm -hmm. And you can maybe support it with your pinky by putting it behind there or whatever you're doing, right? Mm -hmm. You don't have to... The Martini action... You have to break contact, so you drop it, and then you come back and find this lever position and drop it. Mm -hmm. Whereas that one, you're in the lever position right at the start. Right. Now, I do know that there does need to be kind of a snap to popping the cartridges out, too, with these. So I know I, I made sure I opened these with gusto. I will say it does barely take any sort of leverage to kind of get that open. Now, I understand that it's Yeah, your hammer's back, not down. So, yeah, maybe that makes a you huge You can actually, difference. if you open the action, mm -hmm. it is possible to ride the trigger. Okay. Uh, as a matter of fact, the triggers are so horrendous on this. Um, Maybe I'll let you do this if you practice. Yeah, let me show you. I'll show you because it's a little weird. The triggers are so bad on these things in terms of their weight, it can often be easier to go ahead and relax the system by overextending the arm, uh -huh. which means you're taking the hammer all the way off the sear, okay. right? Which is the hammer, the, the, the trigger rather. The trigger is the sear. The hammer is directly on cool. it. Cool. All right. If I overextend it, uh -huh. I can pull the trigger without any pressure whatsoever. Oh, yeah. I see. And let it ease down. So this is the fired state. And in the fired state, there is some tension holding it up. Not okay. a lot, but some. So let me give you that. Yeah. And let's just try that from the fired state as a reminder. It's, it's, still, it's still pretty light yeah, by but it's, comparison. It's much easier than this guy. Yeah, you're not wrong. That's fair. And there is some spring tension resistance here compared to before. Up until you recock the action. In which case, then, yes, it kind of just flops around on you. Right. Sure. Okay, so loading, we'll say we'll go ahead and put a cartridge in there, raise it up to pull the trigger. That was, to date, the heaviest trigger pull on a rifle I have ever experienced. I... I honestly don't think I can think of a comparison. It's the Philippine Colt of rifles. 
It is. And it, it, the thing is, at least, I guess, with the Philippine cult, there was some travel. There was some, like, actual build-up momentum I could possibly gain. Well, also with the Philippine cult, you were pulling to the rear. Right. This one, I'm pulling up, which uh, there is a bit of an angle to this trigger here, so I could see how that would make it a little bit easier <laughs> Yeah, but the, it's the, the trigger. angle. So the trigger doesn't quite clear the vertical plane the way you'd want it to. Right. And what it really needs to do is it needs to hook down so that you can get a hold of it. Because look at the trigger on the Philip. We talked about the Philippine Colt. Look yeah. at how, how that trigger was. Right? Oh, yeah, yeah. So. They made room. Yeah, they wanted <laughs> you to be able to hook that thing, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They've made this a stubby little trigger uh -huh. with no hook to it. Nope. And then you have to pull. If you were to try to pull back, you're just going to slip off of it before you'll ever get it to go off. Oh, probably, yeah. So you have to pull back and up. And the thing is, there's no travel. It's, you're right there on the sear, so like you're you're as soon as you pull, as soon as it goes off, it just goes off. It's right. it's right there. Brick so wall. unfortunately, <laughs> pop. It is the thickest brick wall I've had today on a on a rifle. That's right. crazy. Now, how's that thick wrist while trying to pull up into your own hand? Not great. What about your thumb position? Where do you put it? I, I don't know. There's no tell there, I, anywhere. I can put my thumb up in the air, like I'm sipping a cup of tea. I find it. I I'd, I'd really. I'd love to see like the actual users of these at the time. Because I'm sure That'd they were smaller framed than uh -huh. the British, but they went with a thicker wrist than the British mm -hmm. with no thumb placement. And the British already didn't like wrapping their thumb around it to the point they put the thumb pad on it to uh -huh. keep themselves from shooting themselves or bopping themselves in the nose. Right. So I'm not, I really have questions. I have so yeah, many questions. Yeah, so many questions. Um, <laughs> and the recoil, you know, pretty comparable to the martinis actually just right, right there. And then the sound, I will say, was much different. I do remember... It kind of sounded like a crack, like thunder. Now, that is a little unfair comparison because, again, uh, reduced load. Oh, that's so true. So we wouldn't, uh, in theory. It's true. That's true. I forgot about that. In theory, they should sound fairly similar. That's fair. But it's actually kind of hard to say because I'm not sure how good of a fit you have all the way down the bore on this. Um, I've heard there's a lot. Talent. I've heard in a lot of cases on these guns, there's they all share a very accurate narrowest point, but not necessarily... Is it the same narrowness all the way down the bore? Mm -hmm. um, it is not nearly as even rifling as there was in the Martini. And then it has actually Martini style sights like V notch rear, uh, barley corn front. Yeah, other than the trigger pull, once you got behind it, I don't know that you'd notice it wasn't a Martini. Like, yeah. So lining, lining up the sights, when you just think you're up, aiming a yeah, Martini. Everything about that is just very Martini esque, I will say. Although at least you know they did a little bit of tiny bit of relief here at the front of the breech. They're just like, oh yeah, let's let's relieve yeah, that clear, right there. Clear a little notch a little, so you can see the rear sight. Little tiny notch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> uh, no, yeah. Overall, not a glowing review. Also, it's heavy as sin. Is this heavier than the Martini? I want to uh, say it is slightly. Let me see here for overall length. May I see that? Yeah. We should be. Oops, He's gonna bump, bump everything. Thing. About. What is that, uh, half an inch, three quarters of an inch longer? I think that's about an inch. Uh, no, it's not a whole inch. Hold on. Oh, uh, no, yeah, maybe it's about half an inch. Yeah. But it is slightly longer than Martini, which is a weird choice to make. Sure. And also, yeah, it feels a little heavier. <laughs> so. <laughs> okay. Glowing reviews. However, the, the one good thing is it was made in Nepal. If you can't get a Martini, this is the Martini you have at home, then you can make it home. Mm hmm. Okay. Sure. <laughs> I guess it's better than nothing. May I ask you a challenging question? Oh, uh, sure. If both of these rifles were made by the same factory in Britain of to the same quality, which would you prefer? Martini. Why is that? Well, again, I'm, I'm saying if I have literally a copy of this, uh -huh. but it, it's just more polished. Like high quality. Sure, high quality. I'd still end up going with the Martini itself because... They've done some improvements with the Martini where they, they cover up the action so that it's a little more mm -hmm. sec secured for where the, you know, the trigger seer interaction is. They actually tell you more on that one where you're supposed to be handling it as far as cocking the action, where to put your thumb, whenever your placement with the trigger is. Right. Inherently, that just seems more stable of a design. The engineer in me wants to pick that rifle. Why? It's simpler. simpler inside? It's simpler. It's more efficient yeah, I mean, in design. I get that. However, there's a couple of weird things that... Actually, I was discussing this with Bruno. And Bruno, our animator, couldn't figure out, and I can't figure out either, mm -hmm. why they chose certain key dimensions that they did. I, there may be an explanation buried deep in there. But the biggest one is the hammer axis. And then remember, way back in the episode, we mentioned that the one thing they changed from... One of the things they changed from Wesley Richards was making sure that the hammer axis was a um, shared center point with our uh, lever. Okay. Okay. 
And so when they did that, they created a situation in which you have this impossible position for the trigger in order for it to function correctly with the available rigidity of metal that they had for how they were constructing this. Sure. So what you've done is you've shoved the trigger all this way forward mm -hmm. and at this weird angle, which is why we're pulling up and why... So that it can reach right. with the hammer properly. In, in theory, even with those problems, you can lighten the hammer pull, or the trigger pull rather. You can lighten the trigger pull by lightening the hammer, but you need to be fairly heavy in order to strike. And actually pop primer. Right, so the only other option you have is to change the sort of incline between the trigger sear surface and the hammer sear surface. Right. But if you change that too much, it slips off too easily and you end up with problems because you have no safety. Sure. So there's a number of things where the gun became so efficient that it created its own problems that would have need to be corrected by either adding parts or really studying the dimensions. Well, it's completely safe in that there's no way I'm accidentally pulling this trigger. I'm gonna right. say that right now. <laughs> no way in heck. So I'm sympathetic to the gun. I think it's actually quite brilliant. I think it's especially brilliant that it could be executed domestically in Nepal with the materials available and safely shoot 450 mm -hmm. martini. Mm -hmm. However, disregarding the hand fittedness of it, there are still some inherent problems that mean that unfortunately the martini is a better design. Even though I think if you cleaned up the geometries, I would actually find that to be superior. I would be curious to try a really polished one. Yeah. That'd be nice. That'd be interesting to see. But unfortunately, there is, I don't know of any external manufacturer of the Gehendra. You'd have to make it quite different in some ways. Okay. So I still love it conceptually. Sure. Uh, with the rifle set aside. Literally. Now, you don't care for that. This is funny because I'm sympathetic. You're just like, no, this thing's rough. Right. Uh, let's talk about the carbine. Okay. Because you always love carbines better than rifles. Now, because of the hand fit nature of these, we did not want to potentially overstress the spring from this gun. We could have theoretically stolen the spring from this mm -hmm. gun and put it into our improved long rifle, but that wasn't going to tell us much. Um, this improved long rifle, frankly, looks to be in much better condition. The screws are all fit. The heads aren't torn up. Sure. The sling swivel looks great. Mm -hmm. But does any of that really sell you that this is going to be different from that? I mean, it, it, it certainly looks more polished um, than our previous boy, and... I mean, on top of that, I know they've re they've gone to one V spring now. They were able to make the action even simpler, which is kind of cool. Right. It's still not very confidence inspiring. So no, no, not really. I'll tell you guys, the trigger's not improved. Um, it, it looks nice. Don't get me wrong. It looks, yeah, yeah, looks yeah. a million times better. I'd pick this over that. It's certainly sure. But that's just because of the wear, you know. Right. Uh, newer model. That's just a nicer version. Right. Um, it may, I mean, maybe it was hand fitted better. To be honest with you, who knows? It, it does look does like they're probably getting better at it. As much? No, this is very solid. This feels here. Let me. We haven't shot it, but go ahead and handle it. Yeah. That feels more like a martini. Yeah, this actually feels more solid. Like I'm not feeling that rattle you're hearing. It's just the sling swivel up there. I actually yeah, worked really the action. There's no spring tension, here. unfortunately, because this one has. Uh, yeah, it's nice and tight. Yeah. But unfortunately, it won't fire on you because we have no hammer spring. Right, right, right. But as I was saying, um, the springs are so hand fit, and given the scarcity of these carbines, while I could have theoretically stolen the V spring from this and shoved it in there and shot mm -hmm. it, I really didn't want to accidentally have a problem. And I have seen one Reich's revolver eat three nose springs because there happened to be a burr in it. And oh, so, wow, that was amazing. Yeah. If there happens to be something about this gun that ate its previous spring, I don't want it eating this spring until I understand why. Fair. So um, I thought. You know, we're moving a screw, we're changing the spring. Mm -hmm. It's really not worth it to shoot this versus that. That's fair. I could see that. So what we did choose, though, is to shoot the carbine, because yes. that is distinctly different. Uh, well, it's already lighter. At least there's that. Uh, okay. Got it? Yeah. Lighter, okay. handier? Lighter, handier, still Gehendra. <laughs> What's that mean? Is that um, confidence inspiring? Look at it. No, I mean, to be fair, it, it is lighter, more mobile, so that's going to be uh, nicer in some regard. No magazine capacity increase, I see. No, I'm just teasing. Yeah. Um, that's good when the lever arm goes back and forth like that, right? Yeah, that's, it's quality That's confidence fit. inspiring. Well, you okay. get that right in the vice for you. It'll fix it. That's great. So somehow the carbine's in worse condition, even though it's younger. Yeah, I'll buy a lot. Cool. Awesome. And we have carbine sights now, which are, let's see if they've improved. Not really, no. They're actually quite confusing. The, yeah. the sight protectors are really not distinct from the front sight. Are almost equal height. Oh no, they are equal height. Oh yeah, my you just goodness. have three that's front sights. That's horrible. Sites. No, that's windage. It's There's windage. a slight taper to them where they 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 mm -hmm. go in a little bit, so you can tell it's not quite identical. But dang, that's too close, man. Yeah, they should spread that, that out. Just get on that left or right. Yeah, right. 
oh my god, I don't like that. And then the trigger was no different. The yeah. action really didn't feel any different. It recoiled so, lighter, but then again, we also gave you a lighter cartridge. All right. So how was that recoil? Did you like it in the carbine? Um. Well, it it was a carbine load that we made even lighter. So realistically, it really wasn't that bad. Yeah, I was gonna say it's. Yeah. We're kind of pipsqueaking it. Even it's so, though, there's powder, a fair bit. Of, I mean, so. there's a fair bit of lift for a pipsqueak load, but yeah. yeah, yeah. Good plumes. Now, performance-wise, you didn't do nearly as well on target with that. That's true. I did hit lower with this guy in general, um, which I wasn't quite expecting. But I, whenever I, I set my group, wherever I set my sights, I'm just I'm I'm lining right up on that every time to make sure the grouping is as tight as I possibly can get it. Right. Neither of these rifles were particularly zeroed. I remember we had to adjust for fire on the the long rifle. But you know, being at, a, at what was it 70, 70 yards? That's yeah. pretty good. Yeah. That's pretty all right. No, but your first shot was wild. We had to, remember, we had to get you aiming to, I think, like the right edge or something like that. Yeah, something about like I had to literally aim to the right edge. And I promise I was not looking at the front sight off. Like I was looking on in this middle right. of the front sight. So there was some Kentucky windage on this. Just a touch. Because neither guns were in particularly good zero, which actually with the rifles in this series, they usually are. We actually tend to do very little deviation left and right. Yep. If anything, we have to change um, our vertical uh, aim. Yeah, height. Because... A lot of guns are zeroed for 300 yards or something. Right. And we're shooting at 70. And they so. may not have a battle sight option or anything like right, that. Right, right, right. So. Um, which these do not either, by the way. It's just a nope. fold forward ladder. Yep. So, nice and simple. Uh, out of the two, would you choose rifle or carbine? Because it, you know, because it came later, I actually would just go with the carbine because they, it would presumably be in better condition and presumably well, I mean, this, be this, tighter. This rifle's in better condition than that carbine, and these both came from about the same year. They're both the, this is, or not that, on this one over here. Yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. But we don't know, you know, the hammer spring on that one was happening break. with that. So there could be some actual inherent problems to that simpler design. We don't know. Mm, that's fair. I prefer the carbine just because it's handier. That too. Yeah. I mean, Probably it's always handier. It's the same action. I'm just going to take it. Yeah. Uh, overall, would you choose the Gehendra? No. Over any no. of the single action or the single shot rifles we've dealt with so far? That's a good question because we have things like the Mauser 1871 mm -hmm. black powder single shot, but strong Mauser. It's had a, still a solid bolt forward. Okay, Mauser so you're going to take this over the Mauser? I don't think so. No, I don't think. I can't see when I, how I would actually. The Mauser bolt action is okay. stronger in here. Rolling block? No, rolling block is stronger. I'd okay. take the rolling block over uh, this. Comblane? No, I wouldn't take the com. No, I wouldn't take this over the complaint. No. Okay. By the way, I'm talking about I'm as to... I'm talking about as manufactured in Nepal. By the way, not just as a oh, concept. Oh wait, the Nepalese have to are they equipped to be able to handle the construction of those? Pieces? Well, they made these. No, I'm not saying the other ones manufactured. Oh in Nepal. my god, I'm saying I was thinking this particular rifle they? made in Nepal. Is there any one of the breech loaders, the single shot breech loaders that we've done that would rank behind this? I mean, I'm fairly god, sure I know the think. answer. No. I don't. I don't know. I, I don't know. It's the thing is, I don't think we have one that we shot that I would take under these. I consider this to be the king of the handmade guns. If I if I'm to be honest. So what? Hold on. So what's below? What's the queen? Like things uh, that we've never covered. So we're talking about Chinese made one offs. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Um, well, there was one other gun that we did shoot with safety glasses on the series, which was the Betterly. Yeah, but that was a conversion, and that was to a magazine and blah blah blah. There's other issues. Right. There's other issues with that. No, this. This is, I don't want to dog it. I'm not trying to sit here and make fun of it. Right. I legitimately think this is one of the best handmade guns, especially at that time. Oh, my mm -hmm. God. But if you look at some of the, the simplest ones. Yes. If you look at some of the more unusual things that come out of China, that come out of um, like the Khyber Pass, this is doing very well mm -hmm. for what is a very nascent industry. However, it is still leagues behind what was modern manufacturing at the time. Right. Um, and it's not exactly confidence inspiring. However, we didn't shoot it and nobody blew up. I'm very happy to report I did not blow up. So. <laughs> Good job, Susan Liamo. Yeah, I know. Proud on that front. <laughs> Would you want to go plinking with this on the regular? Mm, I think if I had one that I, I knew very, very well and trusted very well. Mm -hmm. I could see that being a nice, fun, relaxing afternoon. But plinking, not really so much as just a few rounds here and there, just mm. for the smell of it, just for the feel of it, just for the sound of it. I mean, they do make like the 45, uh, 45 inserts, ACP yeah. inserts for the 450. Presumably for like that, that could fit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't That'd think 45 kind of ACP would give this I mean, I don't think it'd be very accurate, but it'd be pretty no, no, funny. No, be pretty funny. Yeah. Um, 
no, I love the Gehendra. I think it's very beautiful. How do you feel aesthetically? Does, does it... Uh, not, it? Not your thing? I mean, it's... Be honest. Different. Be honest? What yeah. am I not honest? Okay, I'm just saying. It It's different. It's not... Um, displeasing for some of its shapes and especially like the swoop that comes with the arm on this one the mm -hmm. flare that it comes back out i can see where there was some attempt at beauty um what about compared to this well the, the i mean mm, i i will say that this one had potentially better elegance potential in I terms agree. of appearance i agree there's definitely a there's a flare with it's this not that it's a more unified aesthetic look to me which is odd because it's just a military rifle. It's no, not yeah. supposed to be. You know what it is? Remember when we were talking about the Japanese Arisaka and one of the goals was um, by Kajiro Nambu was that it needed to be beautiful mm -hmm. so that um, people would know to take care of it. Sure. There's something about this that's much more industrial in design and less organic looking. Yet that was taken care of. Well, yeah, they were ordered to. <laughs> the... Actually, I want to point out, you said this was taken care of. This was taken care of by the Nepalese. Like, they took care of it. Well, that's my favorite part, is that they, they look between the two and went, oh, clearly we must take care of this well, one. Well, it was better made to begin with. But I will say, just looking at it, that looks like more of an art piece than this there one. There is more of a flow, like a river to this guy, I will say. It is that's, that's more like you'd see something in, like, a fantasy series. I could see that. Like, if you're like, oh, what were, you know, around the 1880s, what were elves armed with? It'd be that. Right. Versus this. This is more dwarfish. That's sure. All right, fine. I don't see it, but sure. Okay. That's because you have no sense of, of uh, fantasy or right. adventure. Of oh, sure. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I think that I think that covers everything on these guys, actually. Yeah, it does. That's pretty good. So, uh, pretty good review on the Gehendras. I want to put out special thanks again to our author who uh, really gave us the most information on this. I hate to say this. He doesn't have a current book available. <gasps> However, he does have the one that's still, I believe, available through IMA. And then there is also, if you check the link in the description, a survey option. So if you have a Gehendra, there is someone out there who would like very much to know everything that you can tell them about your Gehendra because he is still trying to find out more data on this particular rifle. So cool. get a look at that. See if you can help out with further advancing the research on, well, not this. This is a martini. These are the guys doing, guns. like, a lot of the heavy lifting to start that. We utilize their research to produce these episodes. So, please, if you have something to give them, just information-wise, please, please, please put it out there. Yeah. All right. Otherwise, we'll catch you guys next time. Bye, everybody. So, speaking of multiple ways to get to the same thing, Jeff has made this a very handsome rifle from an engineering perspective. Now, he was limited. There's a number of times, actually, I spoke to him, and I went, why are you doing it this way? And the answer was, well, by the time we make one part that can do these three things, that part ends up being 50 bucks a pop or whatever it is. But these three springs and pins or whatever we're using are, are less than a penny when we buy them by the 10,000s. Right, you know? right. And it's it's... That's the other thing. You look at guns and you're like, why did they accomplish it? You know, like, why was it done yeah, this why way? Yeah, why are there sometimes 30 parts when there could be seven? Sometimes it's just manufacturing. It, it's cheaper to get an off-the-shelf component and use it, like like you said, three of them. Right. Or as opposed to making some complex piece. High Point's still in business. Yeah, but High Point has a utility. <laughs> like, right. But High Point's not selling on novelty. They're selling no, no. on utility. I guess, but they are. But it's it, it they're not selling on... They're honest about what they are, right? right. We've, we've had this discussion before. It's not a pretty gun. It's not the easiest to take apart. you got to knock a roll pin out to take the gun apart. Yeah, but the people who buying them aren't taking them apart. Right. But the point is, it's super cheap, and it works. Right. And it's triggers like a staple gun, but they don't try to pretend it's anything but a trigger like a staple gun. I wonder how many lives that trigger saved. <laughs> it, that's actually a great question. I bet you more high points have saved lives than some other common gun we know. <laughs> So, the biggest change from the Mark I to the Mark II is internal. It's the way the trigger works. But you can see some of it externally. Uh, ignore this bit of grease and ignore that hole right there. But you can see it externally 
in the way that the trigger guard is set up. We have this beautiful piece of shrouding, this bit of metal here that wraps around the front of the